Actually, I just realized something that uh, I shouldn't have done in this problem. I made this object uh, a ball, but if the object is a ball, it would be rolling. And rolling motion is actually more complicated than just sliding. So let's make it a box. So let's think it's a box instead. You, you're going to have to learn how to do rolling problems too, but we shouldn't start with that. Those are more difficult. So let's think that this is a box. How is it, if it's a box, how can it be moving? Well, because this is a frictionless inclined plane. So the box is still going to be able to just slide right down. All right, so anyway, here we just have something that's sliding. Well, remember that when we got to here, how fast was the object moving here? 10.8 meters per second. All right, now, um, now we know that if there was no friction, it could just go sliding on forever. Well, but if there is friction now on this portion, eventually it will come to a halt. Now the question is, how far will the object slide before coming to rest? So, so what we're assuming is that there was no friction when we were moving down the slope, and now there is friction. So we're assuming again no friction on the slope, but now there is friction. So I was just trying to extend the problem we were working on before. So um, suppose that there is uh, no friction going down the slope, but let's say that once we get to the bottom of the slope, the ground now does have friction. So that's going to bring us to a halt eventually. And the question is, how far is the object going to move before coming to rest? Well, let's continue going through that together. And again, we're going to try to use this method from the handout. So uh, what's our step one? Identify the initial and final points. Well, what would the initial and final points be now when you're ready? The initial point is there. Um, the final point. So we should erase these. Yeah, our old final point. When we just get to the bottom of the slope, where we just get to the transition between where there's no friction and where there is friction. And what would the final point be? Somewhere else. Yeah, that's what we're trying to figure out, kind of. Notice that when you're doing a multi-part problem, you might have to change what your initial and final part points are for different parts of the problem. So now here we have our new initial and final part. All right, and then the next step, what would the next step be? Identify the forces. Right, again, maybe, um, when, notice that when we're working with work, we're focusing on an interval. This is kind of different from Newton's second law. In Newton's second law, we're kind of focusing just at one instant. But for work, we're focusing on an interval. You can see that because there's always an initial and a final point. So maybe it helps to focus on what the object would look like in the middle of the interval. Well, what would be the forces on the object in the middle of this interval? Friction. Yeah, that's right. Good. There would be friction because we said there's friction. What direction would that be in? That's something we'll have to figure out. But since it's not obvious to you yet, let's look at both components, and later, if we need to, we can throw one of them out. So what would be all the forces in any component? How do we know the friction is to the left? Because that's what's going to oppose sliding. What are the other forces? Um, normal and gravity. What direction would gravity be in? Down. Of course, gravity is the weight. And nor the normal force would be? Up. Now that we're on a horizontal surface, the normal force is pointing straight up, perpendicular <laughs> to that surface. Any other forces? Tell me. That's a very important question. What are the units for velocity? Uh, what are the units for force? So we know they can't be the same thing. That's just one reason why it's good to think about that. In any case, remember, um, so let's actually do that. What, what's the direction of the velocity here? So I'm going to write that down. But I'm not going to write it down here, because that might make me think that the velocity is a force. I'm going to write it up here. So yeah, this is, I'm glad that you brought that up. A lot of people would say that there has to be a force to the right because we're moving to the right. But remember, that's the old, um, old fashioned way of thinking before Galileo and Newton. Remember that people used to think that forces cause velocity, but that's just not true. Forces cause accelerations. It doesn't take any force to move you to the right. Um, remember that once an object is in motion, it tends to stay in motion um, unless there's a force to prevent that. 
So um, we don't need any rightward force for this object over here. Uh, if you really need an explanation for why this is moving to the right, you could say the explanation is inertia. It was already moving to the right over here, and inertia will continue to have it moving to the right until friction overcomes that. But maybe it's better just to say that there's just no relationship between the velocity in an instant and the force in an instant. All right, so um, are these the only forces? Yes, how do we know? Well, look at the weight and ask what's touching the object. Well, the only thing touching the object here is the ground. So that's the only other thing that can exert a force. And here the ground is exerting the normal force and friction. OK, so those are all the forces on the uh, object. Um, so uh, let's see, what's our next step? Oh, yeah, so what should we do now? On the right track. Let's try to spell that out a little. Before we do anything, we have to identify, as part of step two, identify the conservative and non conservative forces. We're actually not done with step two here because we haven't identified who's conservative and who's non conservative. So, how about the weight? Is that conservative or non conservative? Conservative. Conservative. How about friction? How do we know? Because it's not the weight or the spring force. The only conservative forces this term are the weight and the spring force. How about this? Non conservative. Non conservative. Okay, good. Now step three, we want to identify the work done by each non-conservative force and plug them into the left-hand side of our equation. What, what's the equation that we're using? This is our key equation. This is like net force equals ma. This is the key equation that we keep starting with. But what we have to do is point to every single force and see if it's going to give us a number to plug in here. So let's start with the weight. Is the weight going to give me a number to plug in on the left-hand side here? No. No? Why not? because it's conservative, and because it's not doing work, both of those reasons. Uh, even if it was doing work, we still wouldn't plug it in here. The weight was doing work in this case, but we still didn't plug it in because it was conservative. Here, you're right, the work isn't doing any work. The weight isn't doing work because it's perpendicular to the motion. So we don't plug that in. All right, how about friction? Is that doing work? Yes. So we need the work done by friction. Let's actually go ahead and, and work out uh, what that's going to be. How can we calculate um, the work that's going to be done by uh, friction? Um, so we need to go ahead and um, work that out here now. It's, isn't it mu times, times k? Let's try working that out. Mu times n. Oh, uh, that's why we need the normal force. That's right, good. Remember, what's our equation for calculating the work? Remember, this was our basic formula for figuring out the work, f parallel times delta r. Um, remember that this only gives us the magnitude. It's our job to put in the sign. So let's do the sign first. Is friction here going to be doing positive work, negative work, or zero? Excellent. Most students would miss that. How do we know it's doing negative work? That's why it was so important to write down the velocity vector here. Basically, if the force is speeding you up, it's doing positive work. And if the force is slowing you down, it's doing negative work. Well, clearly here the friction is slowing us down, so friction will be doing negative work. The formula doesn't really tell us that. That's based on our common sense, so we can't forget about that, putting in that negative sign. OK, and uh, then what should we write in for f parallel? Well, in this case, the entire force is parallel to the motion. So we don't need to worry about that cosine theta term or whatever. So what we need here is just the force of friction, the force of the kinetic friction. And how about delta r? Well, did you see that delta r is what the question is asking us for? The question is asking how far are we going to move? So it wouldn't make sense to plug in a number for delta r. I'm, I think I'm just going to plug in d for distance here. In this introductory course, it doesn't much matter whether you think about displacement or distance when you're doing work. But that's what the question is asking. What distance are we going to move before we come to a halt? So this is the formula that we're going to use to calculate the work that's done by friction. Um, well, we can leave this as an unknown, because that's what the question is. 
but we really do need to figure out the work that's being done by uh, the force of friction. So how can we calculate the force of friction? 0.3 times W, because it's the same as it. Right, so let's spell that out here. The friction is mu k times the normal force in magnitude. And how do you how do you know what the normal force is going to be? 